Well, you may wonder what makes a young boy so enraptured by the music industry that it seems every minute detail of every artist and their music from the 60s on has become a lifelong mission to catalogue and publish. David Johnson, author and musician, is here to tell us about his passion. His book, Music Goes Round My Head. Welcome, David. Thanks very much, Wendy. Okay, let's start from the beginning. Were you raised in the city or the country? Yeah, I was living in, uh, in suburban Melbourne in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. And I was listening to whatever sort of pop music was on, uh, Cliff Richard, just anyone, Bobby Rydell, all, all those soft sort of rock and roll acts after the, 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 the 56 rock boom of Chuck Berry and Elvis and all of that sort of died away. And then in 1963, when I was 13, along came this funny little song that I heard on 3LO. I, I wasn't allowed to listen to commercial radio, so there was uh, a little program that went for half an hour on Pete Smith's, uh, on 3LO, uh, compared by Pete Smith, uh, called The Hit Parade. And um, he played all these sorts of songs. And then all, all of a sudden on came this song, and it was, Na -na 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 -na. And I thought, that's weird. It's it's what is it? It's it's not like any. It's not like Cliff Richard. It's it's not rock and roll. It's just something in its own category. And of course, it was the Beatles. The Beatles with the first song that really became a hit in Australia. Of course, they'd had hits in England. When you started going to these new style sort of what would you call them? Concerts, dances. Well, once again, I, I said that I was brought up in a fairly protected uh, household. So, as I said, I, we weren't allowed to listen to Stan the Man on 3UZ or anything like that. I sort of sneaked listens, but uh, for a long time that, that was pretty much it. And, and uh, my parents would have been horrified if I'd, if I'd gone into you know, an inner city venue. But I still managed to, to get out there. There were local dancers, so I remember seeing, for example, the Twilights when they first came over from, from Adelaide. Uh, down at a local dance, black and blue, at the, the Baldwin RSL. So your most memorable um, concert, I think, was the Twilights? Certainly one of the, one of the earliest memorable ones because, uh, talk about emulating the Beatles, they came across from Adelaide and they just, they just had it all down, you know. As well as that, they were a six-piece band, they had Glenn Shorrock out front, they had his second banana, Paddy McCartney, another vocalist, terrific singer, never got the credit uh, that he should have. And, and I did ask a couple of the members, well, did you ever sort of think, is this guy a bit superfluous? Because lots of other guys in the band sang as well. And they said, no, they always wanted Paddy in the band because he, he was such a great singer. So, so they, were, they were just, you know, and one this, of the best. They'd also come out from England, or Glenn had. Yeah, a lot of them had. Terry a lot Britain. of the kids in Adelaide yes. had come out. What was it? The ten quid. Ten pound pom. Ten pound pom. Ten quid poms. Yeah. yeah. So they had that influence even before they left the UK. Well, the Adelaide thing is quite extraordinary because up in Billy Thorpe really started it all up in Sydney. Of course, he was a ten quid pom as well, but he was the first. The, to, to actually latch onto that, that Beatles thing. And you can imagine he would have been, can't you? Mm. And, and he, he sort of had things like Poison Ivy and Sick and Tired and so on. But then the focus shifted to Melbourne in a big way and you had people like Bobby and Laurie and so on. And all the time, other places like Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth were sort of languishing there, but they had their own scene. And this yeah. was the thing in, in Australia at the time. It was very parochial. So there was the Melbourne scene and the Sydney scene. And the Adelaide scene, it was the big Melbourne-Sydney thing. Adelaide... Adelaide had, had it all. They, they had. had a huge number of English migrants. And the, the, the biggest thing that happened to Adelaide was that they were not part of the Beatles tour in 1964. They were left off the itinerary. They sent a, a, a huge petition to um, uh, uh, Ken Bronziak. And, and so he, he relented and, and put the Beatles on there. When the Beatles arrived in Adelaide, they had the biggest reception that, any, that they had ever had or ever did have anywhere in the world. What do you think Adelaide. was behind Ken Brodsack's thinking when he didn't put them into Adelaide in the first place? Just a small 
Tandy hadn't done his homework. He I didn't realise that the huge density the of, 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 from of um, yeah. English migrants that were living in Elizabeth, which was a, 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 a purpose-built satellite town of Adelaide, filled with guys walking around with beetle haircuts and duffel coats and, and girls with mini skirts and you know bob haircuts and all this sort of thing and, and all these little pubs, English pubs that they'd sort of created and, and sort of cavern look-alike venues for bands to play. So, so Adelaide was just huge. And of course as you said when the Twilights came to Melbourne, well, so many people, apart from I guess like the Easy Beat, um, so many people just said that the Twilights just hit town and everybody knew about it immediately. They mm. just they just took over Melbourne. Yes, yes, very much so. I mean, before that you had the Strangers who were, who were an excellent band, technically equal to the Twilights, but they, they confined themselves to doing the backing backings for other artists and being the house band on the Go show. and that They weren't really interested. That They were working, as, as the, the fact that I put in the book, they were said to be working, you know, sort of eight days a week, 25 hours a day, or whatever. They, they had plenty of work. The Twilights, they wanted to be a big pop band. So let's get on to the book, which I have right here. You published this yourself. Yes, I oh, did. I won't say published yes. it. You yeah. produced I, I, this. I did the whole thing, really, uh, without blowing my own trumpet, but I wrote it. I wanted to write it. I'm a graphic designer. I decided I'd therefore do all the design and the layout and the, and, and the typesetting. And then having gone that far, I thought, well, I'll pay to have it published because I just didn't want that soul-destroying thing of you know, hocking it around to publisher after publisher. They would tell me very quickly that there have been innumerable other books published about Australian pop music. But think, this is very comprehensive. Well, this is the reason I wanted to do this was I believe this is the first actual history of the time, a sequential history. There have been excellent encyclopedias, there have been biographies and autobiographies, um, but this was the first, I believe, this is the first sort of sequential history. That time is now fading. So many of those artists have died, as That's we right. know. So I wanted to preserve it for all time as a tribute to those artists that inspired me. Okay, we're going to take a short break, but when we come back, I'm just going to ask you to um, actually show us through a couple of your favourite favorite little stories or segments. I know that there was one particular um, song that, uh, I, I, I can't remember, but you'll know who I'm talking about. You, you were adamant that you find out who actually wrote this particular song. I'll have to refer to this book while we're taking a short break, but when we come back, we'll, um, we'll go ahead with that. Be back soon. Rock Down. Welcome back to Rock Down. I'm with David Johnson and this fantastic book, it's the Australian pop music history from 1964 to 69. The music goes around my head. Now look, I have to uh, refer to some of the pages of this book because there is so much in it. But something that took my fancy, I was reading um, a section on Mike Ferber, who of course was one of our very early pop stars in what, say, 63? Oh, 60? oh no, 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 not that early, no. Not that early? Uh, basically, Normie Rowe um, sort of really hit his straps in about 65, and he came out with this you know, very long beetle mop haircut, and, and instantly teenage girls just loved him. So, of course, there then followed a whole lot of pretenders who, who wanted to be the next Normie Rowe. Uh, he had quite a few uh, hit singles very early on in the piece. Yeah, Just and a Poor Boy, that was his debut single, Just a Poor Boy. I mean, what a perfect title for a, a pop star aspirant. I'm just a poor, poor boy, boy looking out under his mop top with those big eyes. Now, you were telling me a wonderful story about uh, you were trying to find the author, author or, I should say, uh, songwriter, of one particular uh, song that he recorded. Yes, that was his uh, follow-up, uh, You Stole My Love, and um, I just can't remember, as I say, I don't have a, an encyclopedic memory of everything that's in the book, but there was some dispute about where that song had come from, and um, uh, there was somewhere I, I read that Graham Goldman had written it, Now Graham Goldman later, of course, came to prominence in 10cc, uh, uh, but during the 60s he was writing pop songs like Bus Stop for the, the Hollies and, and For Your Love for the, for the Yardbirds, completely 
different styles of, of music. Uh, so I, I found Graham Goldman's email address, as I did with all the other artists, and um, I fired off an email to Graham Goldman in, in the UK. And to my great surprise, a reply came back. But it wasn't from Graham himself, it just happened to be from Kevin Godley. Of Godley and Cream. Of Godley and Cream, who originally, with Graham Goldman, had formed 10CC. So I thought, <laughs> this is amazing. So how did that happen? I don't know. They obviously still work together. I, I know that 10CC are touring Australia at the moment. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the lineup is, um, but I'm not sure if Godley's back with Goldman. But as, uh, as we would remember, uh, 10CC sort of split and the, the two quirkier ones, Godley and Cream, did their thing while Graham Goldman and um, I've forgotten the other guy's name, they, they, they went on to do the more poppy 10cc with dreadlock holiday and stuff like that. Going on to a lot of these writers and you're talking about things that Australian artists or songs that Australian artists were recording then, of course a lot of the songs were covers, weren't they? I mean, that most of them actually a had come out. A tremendous number. The Brill Building, all of the writers yeah, in, in New York. Yeah, the Brill Building, or, or just doing a, a straight cover of the latest song released in, in England by, not the Beatles, obviously, it'd be a little bit audacious, but let's let's look down a little bit further. To, ah, The Searchers, they're quite a serviceable band. The number of songs by The Searchers that were covered by Australian artists during that time. And... Uh, a big thrust of my book is originality because that, that is something that I'm very, very big on. So in your opinion, who do you think were some of the most original uh, bands that came out of Australia at the look, time? Look, you know, we can't look any further than the Easy Beats. They, they, th this, this book is titled after one of their songs that they wrote much later in their career. To my w way of thinking, the Easy Beats were one of the greatest 60s artists anywhere in the world. Unfortunately, because they were down here in the Antipodes, they were always just that little step behind. They were still doing rock and roll stuff when it was getting into prog rock over in England. Uh, and um, so unfortunately, with the, obviously the sole exception of Friday on my mind, they really never uh, achieved their true potential, but those songs are just sensational. There are some incredible facts in there that I don't have off the top of my head, but just the sheer volume of songs that Stevie Wright and George, Wright, uh, George Young, not Vandran Young, Stevie Wright and George Young wrote while they were in Australia. The Vandran Young thing didn't really start happening until they moved to England. Until Later, but, yeah. And the reason was that, George, uh, that Harry Vander was Dutch and spoke very poor English and he really didn't have a handle on writing lyrics until, he, uh, until they went to England, at, at which point poor old Stevie was shoved to the side. So do you think the fact that they had come out from Europe was something to do with the fact that their songwriting was so advanced? Uh, obviously there must have been some influence from, from England. Um, but I really think that the melting pot occurred when they were up there in Sydney in that Villawood um, uh, migrant centre and, and they came together and, and, and had jam, you know, jammed in the laundry and so on. And there was just some amazing chemistry that occurred. See, Tony Barber from um, who was Billy Thorpe, in, yeah. Billy Thorpe um, was telling me that a lot of the uh, families that had migrated out from Europe um, had family back, uh, lots of family back in either the UK or Europe. And that was their source of um, getting the music early. Definitely, yes. Um, uh, Tony's brother would send him out all of the latest stuff. And that's, I think Tony's brother sent him um, Poison Ivy. Yes, that's true. Is that correct? Yes, yes. which was a, not a Rolling Stones single in the UK. It was once again just on an EP or something like that. Once Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs had released their version, the Stones record company thought, oh, they're um, getting away with this, so they released the Stones version. And for a little while there, they chased each sort of a, a, up, up the chart, but Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs version finally was the biggest, or the bigger selling version wow, of Poison Wow, that's Island. amazing. That's amazing. Um, we'll take a short break, but there are so many other things I want to ask you about this, but um, we're getting back to, uh, when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the Easy Beats. The Loved Ones. Yes, another very original band. The Atlantics. 
Very, very interesting band, yes. Okay, we'll take a break and be back soon. Rockdown. Welcome back to Rockdown. David Johnson is the author of The Music Goes Round My Head and it's an amazing book. It's, uh, it's Australian pop history from 1964 to 69. One more favourite. Yes. One more favourite Australian original. Well, this is a, 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 a that's a good one because there are obviously lots of others. We we I spoke about the Easy Beats, loved ones, lots and lots of others. Procession and so on, fascinating bands. And uh, as the decade wore on, it became more and more original. But I discovered um, in writing this book about a band that really, to me, just sort of I thought was just a yet another surf instrumental band. Up in Sydney, a place that I knew very little about, having grown up in Melbourne, and I'm talking about the band The Atlantics, mm -hmm. who had huge hits, including here in Melbourne, with uh, surf instrumentals like Bombora, Bombora was and huge. The Crusher. And it's a fascinating story because uh, as they sort of wrote fewer and fewer instrumentals, they started to want to get into vocal music. So they took on board a gentleman by the name of Johnny Reb, not a fresh-faced young teenager uh, like Billy had been, but in fact an old rocker from back in the late 50s, early 60s, pre-Beatles era. And the combination, the chemistry between the Atlantics and Johnny Reb was just extraordinary. And they became one of the most creative bands of the 60s, writing all original material. Now let's talk about the book uh, can you tell me and our viewers uh, about the story behind all the money that is made from this book and Support Act, which is a, a benevolent fund for musicians around Australia. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, fund and um, we ask anybody who can to help Support Act. Um, would you like to elaborate on yeah. um, what As you've As I said done? earlier, I, I did everything and I financed the printing of it, which was quite considerable because I didn't print offshore, I printed in the Yarra Valley where I come from. So it cost quite a lot of money, but I'm very happy to say that I have recouped all of that money uh, with sales. And because I didn't want to make money out of the book, that's pretty stupid, isn't it? Everyone wants to make money. I didn't want to. I just wanted to write the book and, as I said, pay tribute to those musicians. I decided that any profits, if there were any, wasn't assured, I would donate to Support Act. And sure enough, um, I have already made one donation. I, I actually subverted that a little bit. I donated a thousand, uh, an amount of money to uh, the family of um, Michelle Forden, um, who died last year, and um, who was uh, one of our finest actor singers, the original Mary Magdalene in Jesus Christ Superstar. Happy to say, Support Act, that um, I now am in a position to make a, a second donation. This time it will go direct to Support Act, a second uh, sizeable donation. And as I continue to earn money from the book, that's where all the money will be going. Well, I can tell you there are not a lot of people around like you, that's for sure. Speaking of Michelle and um, uh, Michelle's partner, yes. husband, is in your band? Am I correct? Well, he wouldn't like to hear you say that. You're in, his, like, you're in his band. Okay. Uh, no, it's neither of those is true. We're we're all in our own band. And, and Jeffrey Jenkins, um, although he calls himself Jeff Jenkins, and then we discovered there's another guy called Jeff Jenkins, and there was a bit of confusion. The the, the Melbourne music writer music Jeff singer. Jenkins, uh, he he was a, a professional actor, singer, dancer, was in Cats and all of those shows. Never really done much. Uh, rock and roll singing, a little bit, never written any songs, never really played an instrument, but he picked up a guitar about getting on for 10 years ago and immediately started to write songs. And he didn't know whether they were any good, so he asked me one day, well, what do you think of these? So these were, these just blew me away. So he and I um, started working together and then we brought in various other musicians. Cut a long story short, the latest incarnation of this is a, is a four-piece band called The Dukes of Despair. No, I didn't think of that title. Now, our producer, director, Madame, has uh, a favourite song, and I believe that uh, we're going to be seeing a film clip of that. Thank you so much. It's, it's such a, a generous thing that you're doing for Support Act, and, um, and, and just a beautiful thing. Uh, 
you know, you're just a lovely person for doing this and um, all the best with your career with Dukes of Despair. David Johnson, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Wendy. Yeah, I made mistakes and baby, yeah, I paid the price. I have been the kind of fool that won't take good advice. My guiding light is all but blown. In the darkness, I just can't find my way back home. I drank too much, I swore too loud, I stayed out late at night. Tried my hand at honest work, could not make it right. I fell the rod across my Yeah.